Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar from the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC. Uh, the title of today's webinar is The Ins and Outs of Communities of Practice, What They Are, Why You Need Them, and How to Put Them to Work. Um, my name is Tom McGibbon, as you can see there on the front slide. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Mark Adelson, who I will introduce in a few minutes. However, before we begin, I have a few comments to make. Um, first of all, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Uh, however, questions can be asked uh, at any time during the presentation, and in fact, we look forward to those questions by enter entering them through either the Q&A pane uh, in your WebEx control panel or the chat pane, either one. Um, I will be monitoring uh, both of those panels as, as Mark speaks. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, if there are questions, we will uh, ask them and, and Mark will answer them then. Um, w one of the most common questions is about whether or not slides are available, and, and they certainly will be after the, um, after the presentation is over. If you would like a copy, please send me a request. My email address is there on the screen. Um, also, the, uh, we are recording this, and the video and audio will be posted uh, at a later date. Uh, once it is, we will distribute a link. Now, to begin today's presentation, let me give a, a brief uh, summary of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. First of all, please note the web address on the screen, uh, www.thecisiac.com. Uh, we've, we've actually set up what we call a community of practice, as, as, it, as it will, and related to what Mark is talking about today. As I've said before, please also note my email address for any follow-up questions. Uh, the CISIAC uh, is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling, simulation, and for today, knowledge management. Um, we are sponsored by the Defense Technical Information Center, uh, and so uh, this free webinar is provided in part by, by our sponsor. Uh, I work for Quantarian Solutions Incorporated, and that's uh, who operates the, the CISIAC. Um, also, you, uh, you might want to, uh, besides joining us on our website, we have two LinkedIn discussion groups. Uh, one is dealing with titled CISIAC Software, and the other is CISIAC Information Assurance. Uh, so I, at this point, uh, before I, the last thing I have to do is introduce our presenter, but before I do, I would ask, um, Aaron, if he can uh, post a couple of questions, uh, we're interested in um, understanding a little bit more about uh, your familiarity, the attendees' familiarity with um, uh, with this topic area. I'm not sure that's that's actually happening. So, oh, there we go. So the questions have been posted. So if you can all uh, take a moment to answer the a couple of simple questions that are, are there. So at this point, let me introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Mark Adelson is an Associate Professor of Management Economics at George Mason University School of Public Policy. Uh, at Mason, he was the founding director of the master's program in organization development and knowledge management. Uh, the organizational change program focuses on workplace practices emphasizing group and team-based approaches to organizing and communities of practice. Prior to George Mason, uh, Mark taught for more than 20 years in his native South Africa at Vitz University, the Graduate School of Business Administration, where he was head of the general management program. Besides being a teacher, Mark is a writer and researcher. Uh, Mark publishes regularly in academic journals and has authored books, newspaper articles, and papers presented at local and overseas conferences. His most recent book is titled Beyond Management, Taking Charge at Work. Uh, so we're excited to have Mark presenting today. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Mark. So Mark, please proceed. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for that very nice introduction. And thank you for joining us all um, for, the CISIAC, for the CISIAC webinar. Um, I, the title, as Tom said, Ins and Outs of Communities of Practice and the What, the Why, and the How. I'm going to try to outline a story that you won't find in the books. There's a lot of material in texts about communities of practice, and I want to try to provide a bit of a story that helps provide a background and, and 
also uh, gives you some idea of mostly about how communities of practice work and why they're important. Uh, I will also, at the end, certainly at the end of the slides, they'll be in your slide deck, have a number of references that may help you if you're interested in implementing communities of practice. But I want to talk basically from my experience and the things that I think are important. Uh, I have to move through this at quite a clip. My introduction is a little bit slower, but I'm going to be moving through this at quite a clip. Uh, if you need the material, the slides will, will be there, and I hope you'll be able to go back to them. And um, uh, we'll be holding questions till the end, but as the slides are numbered, please just keep, keep in mind those numbers, and uh, perhaps you, you'll want to refer to them at the end as well. So here's the outline. I've really beyond the introduction, divided into four parts I'm going to talk about work, and that gives us the, 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 some of the answers to why communities of practice, talk about the concept of community itself, move on to communities of practice, and finally talk about what it takes to build, to practice communities of practice, the how part. Uh, what I want to emphasize at this point is that When we, when we look at doing something, setting up a booth at a trade show, for example, we expect to get instructions. And the whole point about communities of practice is that the, 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 the task, the, the challenge of setting up communities of practice is not technical. And so it, it's not a question of being able to say, this is how you do it. And I think one of the challenges in reading through books those that focus on the how do tend to present it as a kind of, as, as a set of instructions. So th there are lots of, there's lots of material that you can go to on communities of practice if you're interested, and as I say, I'm, I'm including some of that. But typically organizations struggle with setting up communities of practice. And, and one of the things I want to focus on is, is why this happens and, and what it takes to, to make them work. In fact, in practice, many communities of practice don't work, they fail. And, and the reason for that is the success of communities of practice really depends on participants, the members' attitudes to their work, to each other, and their relationships. And, and of course, you can't mandate attitudes and relationships. You can cultivate these. So the success of communities of practice really depends on the culture how we go about things and, and, and how we try to cultivate our communities of practice. In this slide, I've begun by saying, and, and, and this is really sort of taking us towards the end of the story where I'm going to end up, that we need to distinguish between two types of communities of practice, those that self-organize and, and those that are basically what I call designed communities, which are often seen as top management initiatives. As we'll see, the, the self-organizing ones, although there, there are challenges, that's much easier to do. It's, it's when we try to set up communities of practice in an organization that the real challenges arise. There's lots of material available on how to do this, but most attempts often run out of steam. And, and as I've said, the reason for this is that the success really depends on people's attitudes and values and relationships. It's, it's up to the participants themselves to make these things work. So let me start with a definition of a community of practice and just try to unpack this a little bit. Uh, and this is kind of line by line as I'll be going, a small group of people who've worked together over a period of time. So communities of practice really, as distinct from other types of organizational groups like teams and work groups and communities of interest, communities of practice, um, they really, function well when you have people working together, not just casual interactions, but people who talk to one another a lot, know what the others are doing and so on. And so it usually takes a period of time anyway to build up a community of practice. In, in this definition, the uh, Brown and Gray emphasize that they're different from teams, they're different from task forces and so on. And one of the things that really binds and shapes a community of practice is that they, it's a group of people really working in the same area, doing the same kind of job. 
as they say here, collaborating on a shared task or working together on a product. And another important element, and, and when I think about communities of practice, I think that the two words, communities and practice, the communities I think is, is, is relatively self-explanatory, the practice is the work. Communities and practice need equal emphasis in this concept of communities of practice. And that's not easy to do, um, but this point here that they are peers in the execution of real work. In other words, they're, they're, they're connected by the fact that they're really interested in doing the same kind of stuff. Uh, it's not just that they're sharing information with one another or sharing data with one another. They are engaged in doing the work together and they treat one another as peers. So what holds them together is a common sense of purpose and a real need to understand what each other knows. So, so, so they really um, are, are connected by this desire to, and this need to, to know what's going on, how other people work, what they do, and so on, and to support the work they do. So now I want to work, move on to the work itself. I'll go from um, the, the work to look at communities and then communities of practice, and finally, how we do this. So this is really the, the first, the main, the practices. And, and you'll note from the slide that I've got a, a, an arrow connecting work and organizing. And what I want to emphasize is that in the work we do today, much of what we do during the day in our work is organizing. So effectively, work is organizing. And, and that's something we generally overlook, and it's a critical aspect of why communities of practice are important because what we're doing as we work is organize our work. So the, the question I've started with here is what do we know about our work? You know, what is it, who does it? And really the answer is very little. We don't spend much time thinking or talking or in fact sort of uh, working on, our, on the work. We, we have the story which is the sort of view from, from, from management and management perspective that the focus of what goes on in the workplace is the organization. It's management's job to see that the organization runs effectively. And, and what work, work is a bit of an afterthought. Work is what people do to serve the organization so it can meet its goals. And if we think about what the focus is in the workplace, it's typically what I call these six Ds. We focus on documentation, data, deliverables, directors, directives, deadlines, and dollars. And that's not the work. The work is in producing documentation. The work is in generating data. The work is in uh, being successful in delivering, that sort of thing. And, and so here is my picture of the way we typically, th 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 things kind of work in the workplace, uh, what I call the management universe. And at the center of the organization of these six Ds, and work is an afterthought. So I've looked at work here as kind of on the periphery of, of the management universe. And what we need to do to understand the role of communities of practice and why they're important is to move the work to the center. In fact, having the work on the periphery in today's world where, where the work is everything and the work is challenging and demanding is a huge problem. So I begin by distinguishing, and, and, and this is the sort of theme of, of my book, Beyond Management, I begin by distinguishing two kinds of work. There's factory work, and I think most of us have a broad idea of what factory work is, and that's not what we do. We're not sitting behind desks in rows doing repetitive work, um, using manual skills. What we are doing is knowledge work. So let me just go back for a minute. So I, my representation of knowledge workers, it's difficult to do, is to show people sitting around a table talking. But that's a metaphor. They could be online, uh, doing working virtually, they could be in different offices and so on. But the idea is that it's people engaging one another, and that's the difference between these two diagrams, in, between these two pictures. In a factory environment, people are just focused on doing the same thing over and over again. The fact that you're sitting next to other people really doesn't matter. In a knowledge work environment, which is our work, we are, our work entails engaging other people all the time. So this is just a list of some knowledge workers. And, and from my point of view, almost everybody today is a knowledge worker. Anybody who doesn't 
uh, work on a production line in that kind of factory environment is a knowledge worker. And, and, and knowledge workers do a, 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 an enormous range of work. So, so knowledge workers are not just IT people uh, or people who, who work with data. It's anybody whose work involves basically sharing knowledge. So what is knowledge work? It's what people do when they interact. They engage, they talk to one another, they share knowledge, and the object is to accomplish something together. So what do I mean by sharing knowledge? A, a brief statement about that. It's this process of interacting. And what I want to emphasize here is that this idea of making meaning together, it's not normally part of our everyday conversation, but, but that's really what our work is. We, 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 we have uh, sort of open-ended issues. And, 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 and together, this, this kind of work, knowledge work, is very social. It's people interacting. Uh, and, and what they're doing is really deciding what it is they're doing, how they're going to do it, who's going to do it, and so on. And that's the organizing part. So the, 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 the nucleus, the, the center of what we do in the workplace day to day is actually shape the work we do, to decide what we're going to do, who's going to do it, how we're going to do it, and so on. And this is the organizing. So this is just a quote from one of the uh, sort of major figures who, who in, in helping us to sort of understand what people do at work, and that's Donald Schoen, who, who has a book, great book called The Reflective Practitioner. In real work practice, we're not dealing with problems that are known, that, that are given to us. We have to make sense of uncertain situations, whether it's interpreting a spreadsheet, whether it's working with uh, a client in terms of defining requirements for software projects and so on. There's this process of, of making sense, of making meaning together of what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and so on. And, and Schoen calls the setting the problems. So, so we have to do as professionals today two things. We, we don't have to solve problems. We, we have to decide what the problems are. We have to set the problems. And that's very much a social process, as he says here, in which we do this interactively. So just to summarize in two slides now, summarizing knowledge work and what knowledge workers do, they organize their work while they work. They don't get instructions. The work that we do is fundamentally creative. In other words, until we get to do it, we really don't know what we're doing. It's not routine, and uh, as things can change quickly, we need to be agile. So, so for me, one of the sort of models of how to do knowledge work is 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 the is the uh, agile software development process or the Agile project management process. Software developers, project managers who know Agile have got it. They really understand what it takes to do this kind of work. And the final point here that this is, 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 is social. It's, it's collective work. It's not individual work. So in every way, really, it differs from the factory work model that, that, that's very deeply ingrained in, in management processes. So this is a summary, the work of organizing is social, it's collective, it's creative, it is emergent. In other words, we don't know when we start where we're going to end up. And there's a sort of constant process of finding out, of learning. Uh, it's fluid, and we're always improvising, we're feeling our way. There's often very little that's sort of definite and concrete about it, learning as we go, uh, making sense as we go, improvising as we go. And um, the, this sort of increasingly important idea, I think, that, that, that we, it's, we get it done not by following a comprehensive plan, uh, but by developing and following a comprehensive plan, but by muddling through. So the, in a way, the crucial question that we face in the workplace today, which, which is not a question that people ask, uh, even not a question that, that people focus on, is how do we organize to handle messiness? And, and the point is that our workplaces are not designed for this purpose. Uh, the, 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 uh, the workplaces are designed around this highly structured, repetitive, routine factory work. So this is where this idea of community comes in. It's, it's, the work is social, 
it's collaborative, and it's about sharing knowledge. So I just, just a couple of points that I, I want to emphasize, that we're really very familiar with the idea of community. We, we are, as human beings, as, as Richard McDermott says here, we're, we're, we're really born into communities. And everything we know, we learn through our relationships with others, whether they are family relationships, personal relationships, or work relationships, the knowledge we have is, is acquired by participating in community. So this begins to establish the, the sort of fundamental importance of communities. And, and this is not just something we do in organizations. Communities are central to, to the way we, we live as human beings. The next point here is, so we've looked at community, and the next point here is about sharing knowledge. What does this mean? Our, our, our lives involve, our work involves sharing knowledge. That's the heart of knowledge work. And what I wanted to emphasize that this process of making meaning, what are we doing, how are we doing it, who's doing it, when are we going to do that sort of thing, this is not the same as communicating information or sharing data. So tools that we have for communication, um, online tools, even, even uh, telephones to some extent, or, or data sharing processes, this doesn't get to the issue of sharing knowledge. Mostly when it comes to sharing knowledge in the course of doing our work, what we are trying to share is, is what we want to share is, is tacit knowledge, or what people call know-how, the knowledge that's acquired in practice from experience. That's generally far more important than sort of technical or explicit knowledge what people call know what about rules, regulations, requirements, and systems, and so on. So the tacit knowledge is only shared by people engaging one another, talking to one another about what they know about their experience, and so on. And I think it's, it's pretty clear now, people who do knowledge management, that tacit knowledge and, and explicit knowledge that you can get from books or, or, or documents and so on are not interchangeable. Tacit knowledge really is something that, it, that comes in the context of engaging other people, in the context of conversations, where people draw on their own experience, share their experience, and so on. And what we do in this process is, 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 a synergist, is, is synergistic. We, we really sort of learn, discover together it, when we collaborate. We're not just taking a piece of information and sharing it with somebody else, but creating together the knowledge or the information in the course of our interactions, in the course of our conversations. And this is really what Michael Schrag is, is emphasizing here in the, what is collaboration. He talks about it as a relationship. It's a process of shared creation, uh, creating a shared understanding. And, and, and so this, out of this interaction is this sort of magical process where, where we come to understand what the problems are, uh, we need to go, sometimes go back and kind of work this out over again because it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, an emergent process. But we, out of this comes the shared understanding of, of what we're doing, of what we need to be doing, of what the client wants, of how we're going to do it, and so on. That this is not knowledge that was there before. It's created in the interaction. And, and, and so this is the importance of collaboration, and this is the importance of community in our work is this interaction that produces knowledge um, that, you know, that, 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 that really comes out of the interaction, the synergistic process. So from this, I ask the question, well, where is – our work is, is, is mainly organizing. As, let me just repeat, deciding what we're doing, how we're going to do it, where we're going, who's going to do it, that sort of thing. So I think a, a useful question to ask is not what is the work, but where is the work? And here again, I've got the knowledge workers sitting around the table. Uh, these may be department heads discussing some uh, directive that they've been giving, trying to make sense of it. What do we have to do? What do they expect of us by when? This sort of thing, typical of the work of organizing. And so they're, they're, they're in conversation. What does he want? This is what I think, and so on. This is the essence of the work we do, is this sharing knowledge in conversation. So what I've done is to set a, a, a little uh, oval in the middle there, to just as a, again as a kind of image, as a metaphor, to say that's really where the work is. The work is in the space that we create in our conversations. 
the work is not what I know or what you know, but it's how we come to see and know things together, make meaning together in the course of our conversation. So again, just emphasizing the importance of interaction, of community, of collaboration, of this close, close uh, inter process of, of interaction and participation. And, and, and here in this diagram, flip through it quickly, I'm just in a sort of more technical way trying to explain what's happening in the social space as people interact. There you've got your people around the table, you have a network of conversations, what are they doing? They're negotiating meaning, they're, they're, they're setting up or creating this creative generative space. And what shapes that space is their values, their attitudes, their beliefs, their interests, their relationships that they bring to the conversation. So those are key. Those values and attitudes and their relationships as they in, interact are really what makes the, 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 the what creates the, the sort of capabilities of work in this, what I've called this creative generative space. And out of that, what, come, what comes out of that is, is possibilities for action. So this very social process of people engaging, interacting, sharing knowledge is what creates the possibilities for action, in other words, the work. So the question we're interested in is what does this what does their workspace, this social space in which they interact, look like? What are their relationships? What are their interests? What, what kinds of conversations will they have? Is this a space in which, is the workplace a space in which people easily interact, share knowledge, uh, generate the work together, or is it one in which they have difficulties in, 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 in working together? And, and the last point there is, will they align? Because for them to get on with their work, to move forward, they must be in sort of general agreement about this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and so on. So again, I've set up the space in this diagram, those conversations, and what we're interested in really is what's going on in that space. Is this a space in which people are engaged, listening, aligned? So out of this, really, there are two models for organizing work. The one is very familiar to us. The one that really dominates our workplace is this model. It's organizing through hierarchy. And what I've done is just asked some questions on the right. I'm not going to try to answer those questions now, but to, to really get to this question of how and how well do we organize work, which is really what communities of practice is about, is who has the knowledge we make certain assumptions about who's capable and trustworthy and what, what are the kinds of problems we're dealing with. Are they simple problems, are they tame problems, or are they wicked problems, complex, wicked problems? And in this, uh, of course, this looks a little bit like the org chart with the CEO at the top and uh, kind of the workers at the bottom. Um, the, the assumption, of course, is that the real knowledge is at the top of the organization and that this knowledge gets passed down and sometimes it flows up through the organization from one person to the next through a chain of command. But in fact, that's really a sort of myth. The, the, the way hierarchical organizations is, work is really much more like this. They, they are, it's a very poor structure for, for sharing knowledge and therefore for organizing the kind of work we do. Because what you have in it, almost every interaction is you have a superior and a subordinate. And the superior, the, 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 the whole thinking process is that the, the, the superior speaks, the subordinate listens. So this is not a, a culture, a, a context for sharing knowledge. And so what I've said is what you have is communication that goes down and compliance, you know, that, that's the, the accountability side. The, the compliance is really up the hierarchy. But, but this, uh, this model of organizing really fragments organizations. We talk about silos and so on. And, and that's a huge problem where, on, where our work is collaborative. And one of the things that a sort of mystery here is, is where is the customer, where is the client? And, and this kind of structure, this, this way of organizing, of course, typically is very inwardly focused, not outwardly on the client, but on what's happening inside and, and often very focused on the top. You know, what, what do people above me expect and so on. So in general, it's not a good model for organizing the kind of work that we do. The other way of organizing is, is participation. And here again, I've just, at the center of it, I've got this idea of a space that we make together. We've got people interacting. 
And uh, in that space, they, they engage, they collaborate, they participate, and, and in that space is where the work gets done, um, the people making meaning and so on. So the, the interactions are creative. Something emerges through that interaction that wasn't there. We use expressions like cooking and synergy. It's a space for all stakeholders, including clients. And, and um, uh, one of the things we need to do is to, to, to constantly ask the question, who's engaged, who's involved? Are the people who should be here, are they here together? Are they involved? And the organizing is in the conversation. And, and relationships are the glue. What, what holds this together is the way people interact, their, their relationships and so on. So particip participative processes are the ways we want, is the way we, we want to organize knowledge work. That, the hierarchy doesn't work for knowledge work. It was okay for factories. So the question is what kind of participation? And this is where we move to the idea of communities of practice. Beyond the idea of people simply interacting to specific kinds of interactions. And, and this slide, again, from Michael Schrag, really emphasizes a point that I think we, we don't pay any attention to, and that's that the relationships are the real structure of the workplace. In terms of how we get things done, it's the kinds of relationships that, that we form, the kinds of relationships that are fostered in the work environment. And, uh, so structure is not in, 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 in org charts and things like that. It's, it's, it's in relationships. And that, that's the heart of the work that we do, our ability to do our work. And as he says here, the ingredients of work are the questions and commitments and possibilities. That, that's really uh, what shapes the, the, the work that we do, or that is the, the heart of the work we do. So here is one view of communities of practice. This is from Etienne Wenger, whose, whose original book on communities of practice I still think is the, is the best thing available uh, on, un, to understand communities of practice. It, it, it was really a remarkable book. It still is. And he really identifies these three dimensions. What are communities of practice about? They're, it's people engaged in a joint enterprise. In other words, they are working together on something that, on things that, that, that are meaningful to them together. Uh, that they, they and, and, and this joint enterprise is constantly renegotiated by its members. It's not just people who engage out of interest um, uh, because they want to share information or something, but because they are genuinely sort of committed to looking at their work as something that they do together. How does it function? It functions by their mutual engagement. Again, it's those relationships, the sense that we're all in this together, we're doing the same work, and we have a commitment to, to working together. And, and, and what it produces is not just work in the sense of an output, but we, we have um, resources that we share in common or that we have in common. We, we learn to do things in the, in the same way and to see things in the same way, the routines, the sensibilities, the artifacts. We even develop a similar kind of language and, and ways of working and so on. So those are, are characteristics of a community of practice. From a, an internal view, from the point of view of the work we do, um, I think this is a, a useful outline. Communities of practice are, are characterized by productive inquiry, people finding answers to practical questions. Again, we're back to the real work by interacting with people who know the realities of the work, who, who do similar work, who are sort of closely connected, and they self-organize. Uh, that, that's a, a critical part of this, is that they have the space and they have the support and encouragement and so on to self-organize, and they do this in a spirit of cooperation. They're accountable to each other. They view one another as peers. This hierarchy, when you look at communities of practice, successful ones, there is really very little sense of, 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 of position um, being, being important. People may, in fact, have different formal positions, but as they work together, those issues are, are, relative, are, are, are largely irrelevant. And, and they, they both encourage and guide and counsel and at times admonish one another. They are the, th that's the way they get things done, not through rules and systems and structures, but by uh, guiding, helping, and encouraging one another, and so on. 
And, and I've just noted this in brackets because what this requires is that the acceptance by people in the larger organization that this is a satisfactory way of working, that, that, that we in fact don't need or should do without rules and structures and systems, and that with this kind of work, we benefit from people self-organizing. It, it's necessary. Um, I won't really spend too much time on this. It's a, it's a, a slide from Etienne Wenger about what this, this idea of relations of mutual accountability. That, that I think is perhaps getting at this point is, you know, sort of understanding this point that what makes communities of practice work is, is people's relationships with one another and the sense that they're accountable to one another. And, and, and they work, they, they have this commitment and, and are willing to be held accountable by other members of the, of the, of, of the community. And as he says here, this includes how they treat one another, being personable, tr treating information and resources as something to be shared. So it's really a, a mindset, uh, a mindset about how we interact with one another and how we help and how we support and engage with one another. So the, the last part of my story is, if we like the idea, what are we going to do? And, and, and I just want to sort of highlight a few points here that I, I think are relevant. This is not a technical presentation again, so, so I'm just going to talk to a few issues here. Um, we, we need to distinguish again, this is where I started, between communities of practice that self-organize, that have evolved spontaneously, and those that are designed or planned. And the, uh, the self-organized ones, well, as far as I no, they've been around for most of human history. I imagine uh, a group of Neanderthals uh, who make flint arrowheads or spears or something like that, being a community of practice, learning from one another, teaching from. And, and that, of course, their, their practice community is just a, a, an outgrowth of their, their clan togetherness, their, their sort of larger community in which they work. Self-organizing communities have problems, but the biggest one is not how to create a community of practice. They really make, you know, the, the problems are about the functioning. Whereas with designed or planned ones, uh, we have this particular problem that, that the management mindset doesn't get the nature of communities of practice. And, and, and setting up communities of practice, as you'll see in, in, in the books, if you go to the references I've given you, is a, often a, a long-winded process uh, because it's really about getting the mindset. And if we don't do that, if we don't get the mindset, then the, the communities of practice are not likely to function. They're likely to, to fall apart, no matter how much money in terms of budgets and, and, and designing and so on go, goes into them. So that's the one issue. And, and, and the other issue is that when they're designed or planned within organizations, organizations typically are hierarchical, top-down, high-control environments. There is t tension between communities of practice and these high-control, top-down ways of organizing. So if I say go and spread the word and form yourselves a community of practice, the chances are that you're going to run into the, the second point there. Management has evolved, the, 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 the culture has evolved as a top-down approach to getting things done, and, and communities of practice are really the antithesis of, of this. Uh, so in terms of getting communities of practice into place, there is first this process of exposing people to the, to the, to the ideas that we've been looking at, the kind of work we do, what it takes to do this work, so that the work is people interacting, making meaning, the synergies that come from collaboration and so on. We have to think about the work in a way that's the first step, I think. And then have people accept that, 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 that this, is, this is really what communities of practice are about. And Ron Heifetz, who teaches leadership at, at Harvard, calls this process of coming to terms with these issues it's not technical, it's, it's adaptive. It's all about people's values and attitudes and beliefs. So what we're really doing, if we want to make communities of practice vibrant, if we want to make them stick in organizations, it's all about changing attitudes and values and beliefs. It's, it's adaptive work. That doesn't come quickly. It's a slow process, really, of, of working at uh, 
understanding what the issues are and understanding what the, the challenges are, understanding what the obstacles are, and seeing the tension between uh, the self-organizing, which is essential for, for the kind of work we do, which the Agile programmers get, uh, Agile, uh, Agile project management and so on, get. It's, it, it, in order to get this work done well, we have to be flexible, we have to be agile, we have to be self-organizing. But this is a, this is a challenge in, 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 in a bigger sort of corporate organizational setting. So uh, when, when we look at successes in adopting communities of practice, spontaneously formed communities of practice, they, they evolve easily because they're spontaneous, and they invariably do better under the radar where people are not constantly quest questioning what people are doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it and so on. And design communities take a lot of work. We have to create and sustain them. And, and, and in a way, they're, they're constantly threatened by ordinary factory work practices that exist in high control organizations. So, so even when communities of practice do take off in organizations, there's, there's always this risk that if people begin to pay too much attention to what they're doing and say, this doesn't fit our culture, this doesn't fit the, the sort of high control, top-down way we do things that that uh, you know the communities of practice are, are going to run into problems. So, what do we do to establish communities of practice? You see it as a grassroots effort. It's trying to get everybody who needs to be involved engaged in these conversations about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how do we do this and let's support it, even if we start with a few experts in the organization who are the uh, sort of advocates of communities of practice, it has to be a grassroots effort. It's not something that you, that you mandate, that you dictate, we will have them. It's, it's all about getting people on board and that's about, this is the adaptive work of changing attitudes and values and beliefs and so on. We have to work out how to make it happen. What are these communities we're talking about? How are they best going to practice together? And then the really hard work <laughs> is not in the designing and so on, but is in this facilitating. Creating a space, creating a culture in which communities of practice can flourish. And, and that does take hard work because it's really a sort of challenge to the status quo in many respects. So just the last few slides, I wanted to make the point before we, before we break off here, before I take questions, I hope that the fact that we talk about communities, we typically think about communities as, 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 as great things, but communities also have their sort of shadow side. And, and, and I said, I just took two examples, you know, maybe lynch mobs are, are communities as well, are, are mafioso families, communities of practice. So there's, there's, there's a downside to communities of practice too that if they are functioning, we have to be aware of. There's this tension between the interest of the community and individual initiative, and that's something that so, sometimes emerges. Uh, a core group may put itself above the rest. Remember, it's peer relationships that, that help communities of practice to function. And it bec may become too focused on its own sort of local issues and, and not see the bigger picture. These are always risks. And often what we find is that communities tend to protect their domain of practice. This is the way to do things. They become kind of knowledge police. We'll tell you what you should know and so on. And these are obviously issues that uh, if you have communities of practice that, 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 that you need to pay attention to as well. So it's not just how we set them up, but it's keeping that culture, uh, that sense of, 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 of shared ownership, of commitment, of uh, peer accountability and so on. It's keeping that alive, that, that, that's also an important part of the process. So basically the last slide, and I just wanted to, why, why are communities of practice, first of all, we know now, I think, why they're so important. They're important because there's no better way of organizing the kind of work we do, this creative, emergent, messy work, that, than through people organizing themselves and being committed to what they do and being committed to helping one another do it, that sort of thing. The challenge in setting up communities of practice, which we don't always recognize, is that 
there is this tension between the standard operating procedures of organizations, the management methods, and communities of practice. So what I've done in this last slide is simply to highlight some of the key elements of the standard operating procedures of organizations. Organizations, most hierarchical organizations function by compliance. We have rules and in place and we make sure that we try to make sure that people follow those rules. We have very big uh, structures where people you know are, spend their time overseeing what other people are doing. Not very productive and expensive, but that's the way it works. We focus on competition. They, they're bureaucratic. This divides up the work rather than sharing things. Everybody has their own domain, that sort of thing. And we rely on plans and data and rules. And communities of practice really are the, the opposite of this. They're, they're, they're diametrically opposed. What we want is not a compliance but accountability to one another as peers or to, to people as peers, not rules and so on. Collaboration is the heart of of, of, of sharing knowledge of communities of practice. We want this as a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer relationships. We need flexibility and agility. And the heart of what we do is conversations. Not We want talk, not tools. And good relationships in place of rules is, is the way things work. So I've just ended here with some, some references. And what I would like to say is um, that you know this is a, a mostly a push process where I'm just talking and I, <laughs> I hope people find it interesting and are listening. But I'm also will, happy to take um, uh, email questions and so on. Obviously, there's a limit to how many I can handle. But certainly, if you're interested in community of practice, if you, if you would like me to elaborate on any of this, if you'd like to discuss any of this with me, if you'd like some pointers, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to do so. And, and please feel free to, to, to email me. So. Thank you very much for listening, okay. and I'm well, looking forward to taking questions. Okay. Thank you, um, Mark. That was really excellent. You know, as we at the CISIAC are trying to set up, electron, you know, sort of uh, online communities of practice and stuff like that, it's all uh, the, understanding this framework is very, very enlightening. Uh, there are a number of questions we have. Uh, you'd be glad to know that. Um, and so uh, we have about 13 minutes, I think, or so. Uh, for some questions. Um, so I'll start here. Um, uh, given that the internet is, is a key part of today's knowledge workers, how can they share and collaborate around their internet research and what tools can they use? Mm. That's a great question, Tom. I, I think one of the things I've tried to emphasize is, or not necessarily as in so many words, but the more people can see and talk to one another Typically, the better they do things. So online collaborative tools are great in the sense that they enable us to interact in ways which we could not otherwise do. But always think of face-to-face -face human interaction as, as the first class way of doing things. That's right. really what we want to aim for. That's, 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 that's the prize. Um, interaction online is is necessary, it's very useful, and the tools are great if we do it well. Typically, when, we, when, peop, when organizations set up online tools, they typically set them up as ways of moving information around, uh, of providing people with access to data and so on. So the, um, the, the, the challenge is to see them as spaces in which people can talk. And, and things like discussion spaces, wikis, uh, even blogs are, are better for this than, than document repositories and so on where people share information in that way. So it's, it's really a, a matter, again, of coming to understand what a community of practice is, is that it's engaging one another together to make meaning together to create you know, the, these synergies. So if you're interested in online tools, on, on, on uh, collaborative tools supporting practices, then we, we need to see them in that way. Think about the practices, think about people engaging, and are we using the tools to their fullest extent? Years ago when I started, we, we were using Lotus Notes. It was kind of the only uh, co collaborative tool available. And 
what I discovered, of course, is that most organizations were simply using Lotus Notes as a kind of uh, good email system, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sophisticated email system. And they were not, and they didn't understand the collaboration side. And, and so that is, is something to look out for. That's something to focus attention on. I think that most organizations have got a better idea, but what I still find is that SharePoint is used mainly as a, as a, as a, as a sort of document repository and so on. It's not used really as, a, as the, its collaborative capabilities are not used to their fullest extent. I see. Good, good. Okay. Um, how does social computing, which is a hot research topic nowadays, how does that mm -hmm. fit in? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking about this as a research topic and social networks. Um, I'm not sure if I have the sense of what the question is in terms of social computing, but if I think right. about the, the access to social networks and so on, uh, if we go back to the definition of communities of practice early on about people engaging one another around real work, right? The social networks online tend to be more communities of interest. It's people um, renewing friendships, sort of developing relationships, and, and they're really not typically the foundation for that engaging in real work. It's, they tend to be sort of superficial interactions. The, their virtue is that people do this easily because, I mean, they give us an indication of what it takes for people to engage online. And they must have that sort of interest in sharing. So, 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 so the culture of sharing is there. But people's um, commitment to, you know, I mean, pe people are mostly not there <laughs> to, 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 to engage one another around, around uh, sort of deeper issues. And, and, and I find that with uh, sort of communities of interest on LinkedIn, around knowledge management and communities of practice and so on. You get some good information from that, but, but they are really communities of interest, of people sharing interests, of people sharing some information, rather than people sort of engaging one another to solve real world problems, uh, you know, which, which takes us an ongoing process of interacting, of relationships and so on. I hope I got the question right. well, that's, sort that's of right to, yeah. to respond yeah. to it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next question is, how can we provide incentives for individuals to share instead of hoard their information? That's also a great question, uh, and I think Lots it's one that organizations, <laughs> yeah. organizations struggle with. You see, we, even to, to my mind, the incentive issue is, is problematic because incentives say that working within the existing systems and structures, these high control systems that fragment, that kind of divide people, the competitive systems that encourage people not to share knowledge because you know knowledge is power and that sort of thing that working within those if we provide the right incentives people will share knowledge and and to me that's a sort of non-starter you're, you're you're at cross purposes if you want people to share knowledge you look to the culture you look at what stands in the way of sharing knowledge and if you can take those away then you kind of get to, to the sharing of knowledge building incentives on a system that discourages knowledge sharing is not productive, it's not very useful, and that's why organizations struggle with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you know, there, there, there are incentives, we can provide rewards and so on, but, but I, I honestly think that that's, in a way, that's the wrong question. I'm not saying in this context, I think it's a great question, but, but think about what the, the obstacles are, think about taking those away, and then we probably, you know, uh, be, we, 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 this, this is a much more productive approach. Mm -hmm. Is a community more likely to emerge in some particular kind of industry or organization, such as a small group versus a large group, or for self-motivated yeah. individuals? Again, great question. Self-motivated, self-common uh, interest, individuals with a common interest. And I, what I haven't emphasized is side. Com communities of practice are typically fairly small, so that we don't, th I mean, for them to function, fairly small, maybe, you know, 20 people maximum or 25 people who interact on a regular basis, typically even smaller than that. We never think about or shouldn't even imagine the organization as a community of practice. What we want is to lots of small communities within the organization doing their own thing and connecting with one another. And so we require both. We require both the communities and the connections between the communities. And that takes work. But they are small 
Uh, I think one of the, and I've got the slide up on the screen so people can see it, a great book, and that's why I've got it in red. Uh, if you want to sort of understand communities of practice, in practice, read Julia Orr's book, Talking About Machines. It's well written, it's engaging, it's about um, Xerox salespeople and, 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 and how, you know, how, how they established how they function as a community of practice, out of, basically out on the road. They actually have very little connection to head office, and, and that's one of the things that enables them to, but, but how important this community of practice is and how it really supports their work in terms of getting things done. Okay. Um, let's see, this next one is very specific. Um, how does D. Hawk's version of a community of practice, that being chaotic organizations, relate to your, to your views? Okay, I, I know D. Hock's work. I, I, the chaotic organisation. I, I don't know that I can answer this in sort of accurately, in a, in a, in a, in a, because it's sort of vague, woolly in my mind. Um, I think the okay. point D. Hock is making is that organisations are not s structured, unified entities. They are, consist of lots of people doing different things, and and. And to try to, what we try to do in terms of our traditional management mindset is we try to lump everything together and put it all together under a unified systems of, a system of rules and structures and so on. Now, up to a point, we do need to have plans. We do need to have guidelines. We're human beings. We kind of need to know where we're going. But D. Hock's point is that organizations, today's organizations, these knowledge work organizations really don't function well that way, and we need to find ways of, of supporting the, this, this, uh, this sort of decentralized, this chaotic uh, framework. And that, to me, is what uh, communities of practice are, are about. They're, they, they're really the kinds of organizing processes for getting work done in chaotic organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, I actually have a personal question. I'm sort of, I've sort of been curious as to whether there's any, uh, if there's a generational type of uh, issue here at work. I mean, are, are the is the younger generation more willing to be, you know, part of communities and you know collaborate versus you know the, you know the the older generation of people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, d I didn't think so. I mean, I think that um, we as human beings sort of understand community. We was, were drawn to community. Um, I, I think what we've done is we've set up structures and processes which are, which, which, which really override our sense of community and relationships. You know, the, the idea is in, in a way that you leave your relationships at the door when you come to, to work your, your interpersonal working relationships. Of course, they're, they're, they're central, they play a part, but the thinking is leave them at the door, you know, Use the structure, use the chain of command, use the rules and, and, and the roles that are the formal roles and so on. So I, I don't think that, I mean, I think that the, the, the current generation is, is good with the technology that, that, right. that exists to support this. But, but uh, you know, Fundamentally depending there. on what sort of family you've grown up in and extended families, I mean, you know, people know, <laughs> know yeah. the importance of community and so on. So, right. so I, I, in some ways, I don't think it's a generational thing. Okay, okay. Um, okay, uh, how does Twitter and blogs and other social technologies impact the fundamental need for formal communities of practice? Wow. Um, the way I look at it is that these are tools, and, and, and tools support, always support the work we do. Um, we do our work by engaging one another and by using tools while we do that. So that, uh, you know, whether it's spreadsheets or um, uh, uh, any sort of c computer tools, um, making notes and so on, you know, having, a, having a, an agenda for a meeting, that's a tool. And, 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 and these help our work. So, so Twitter provides us with information, but the work that we do still requires us to make sense of that information. What are we seeing in the online blogs? You know, how is this useful to us? Is it useful to us? Uh, we can get feedback from other people on in blogs and so on, which sort of helps this helps us to 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 helps the synergistic process. But basically, these are just 
tools that support the work we do, and the work we do is in people engaging, interacting, making mm -hmm. meaning, answering these questions. What are we doing? How are we doing it? When are we doing it? Who's doing it? You know, who should be involved? That sort of thing. And, and, and these are just inputs into that process, really. I see. Okay, very good. Well, I think we, we should stop there. Uh, it's, it's 1 o'clock, right, right on the top of the hour. Um, so, again, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for an excellent presentation. Um, all very interesting. There were a couple other questions, so probably what I will do is I will email you those extra questions, and then um, I'll, I'll then re contact the person that uh, asked the question and, uh, and provide them th the answer. So uh, Thanks, Tom. Thank and just w w while we're still online, um, I didn't provide my email address, and perhaps oh, you yeah. want to put it in, into, the, into the slide uh, yeah, before you I'll, send them out. Um, okay. Yes, I'll do that. I'd be glad to do that. So um, Okay. Well, th thanks again, Mark. And uh, I'd like thank to thank everybody much. for attending. Um, so we'll uh, we'll talk to everybody next time.